Well, if you will, take your copy of the Scriptures, and if you're able, stand with me one more time as we turn together to Philippians chapter 1, where we find the text of our lesson today, Philippians chapter 1. We're going to be reading verses 12 through 18. Philippians chapter 1, we're coming now into the meat of the epistle. Paul has addressed the saints. He has given thanks for the saints. He has spoken to them of the way in which he is praying for them. Now we get into the heart of the letter, beginning in verse 12, reading down to verse 18. Hear now God's holy word. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. Congregation, this is the word of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Well, the Apostle Paul was writing while incarcerated, as we've said several times. Philippians is one of Paul's prison epistles. And whether he is writing from Caesarea, where he spent the first two years of this imprisonment, or in the city of Rome, where he spent the latter two years, he has been incarcerated for some time. And understandably, the Philippians would be concerned about his condition, about his state of mind. They're asking about his welfare. They have sent Epaphroditus with a gift. They have sent to materially help and support him in his needs, and yet they are concerned to know how is Paul doing. Pastor, we're praying for you, and we want to know that you're okay. Epaphroditus is going to bring this letter back to the church in Philippi and report on what he found there with Paul, and so of first importance, as Paul begins to write this letter to the brethren, as he gets into the body of the text, he wants to assure them that far from embittered, far from discouraged, He is not only in good spirits, but he sees actual advantage to the situation in which he has found himself for some time. Paul gives thanks for the providence of God that he has met even in prison and the way that he sees God providentially working out of his imprisonment for the proclamation of of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if Paul could give thanks in a trial like this, a trial much greater than probably many of us will ever have to endure, surely we can learn to give thanks as well, no matter our situation. And that is not to make light of any of the trials that we as God's people might go through. It might be, in fact, that some will go through trials that Paul himself would say were greater than his own. And yet I think from our vantage point, It would seem as if Paul's life is just a litany of suffering from the time of his conversion until his eventual execution by the emperor in Rome. And yet also, concurrent with that suffering, we see a life of joyful gratitude, and it comes out nowhere more clearly than in Paul's letter to the Philippian brethren. I want you to look with me, first of all, at verses 12 to 14, as Paul describes the advantages that God has created in the midst of a hard providence. He doesn't just say, we're holding it together. You know, all of us have been in a situation like that. We're going through a hard time, personally, or family, or congregation, but we're holding it together. We're okay. We've got our teeth gritted, our grip is strong, we're going to make it through by God's grace. That's not what Paul says. He says, I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Not only am I okay, the gospel has made progress that it would not otherwise have made had my circumstances been different. Now, this seems impossible to believe at first. You don't want to dispute the Word of God. You don't want to argue with an inspired apostle. But it seems like an impossible optimism that Paul has in these first several verses. How could there be any advantage to sidelining the most effective evangelist in the history of the church? Nobody plants more churches than Paul. 
Nobody has a larger impact for the kingdom of God than the Apostle Paul. How could taking him off the playing field, how could putting him on the bench in prison for two to four years ad- give any advantage in any respect to the progress of the gospel? But that is exactly what Paul claims in these verses. He says that his circumstances have actually advanced the gospel in multiple ways that would not have been the case if he were still preaching and traveling and planting churches as he had been for a number of years by that time. Notice verse 13, it has become evident to the whole palace guard. Now in Greek, this is the word praetorium. And you'll recognize that from the Gospels. I mentioned this in the introduction of the epistle. I'm sure that that sermon is just burning in your mind. You probably probably committed it to memory and you're just reciting it at night when you can't fall asleep. But uh, let me just remind you, This word praetorium refers to the palace guard or the the palace itself, kind of the governor's seat, the place of Roman representative rule. And Jesus, you will recall, was taken into the praetorium and examined by Pilate, but that word is also used by Luke in the book of Acts. In fact, it's the only place outside of the Gospels that it is used in the New Testament, here in Philippians 1 and in the book of Acts to describe the place of Paul's imprisonment while he was in Caesarea, which might be an interesting argument for an earlier date of writing than many scholars would take for this letter. He says it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest, whoever is around them, whoever else he has in mind here, It's become evident to them that my chains are in Christ. Now notice what he's saying and what he's not saying. He's not saying that every one of them have been converted. Although, if you go to the end of the letter, and chapter 4, and verse 22, all the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. Some of them have been. Some of them may have already been converted, but more likely some of them have been converted while Paul is in prison. Now you know who in the Philippian congregation is smiling as he reads this part of the letter. One of the elders has received this from Epaphroditus, or maybe Epaphroditus himself is standing up, reading this letter to the saints on the first Lord's Day after his return. As he gets to this part of the letter, one of the people sitting in the congregation is the Philippian jailer. And he recalls Paul's first visit to the city. And he recalls Paul being beaten in the public square and being thrown into the stocks in the dungeon and at midnight an earthquake... That man recalls taking out his sword prepared to end his own life and Paul calling out in the darkness, do yourself no harm, we're all here. That Philippian jailer was converted in the context of Paul's imprisonment and now Paul says, God's doing it again. He doesn't claim that everyone in the whole palace guard has been converted, but what have they come to know? That he is persecuted for the sake of Christ. Paul is not like the other prisoners in that place. He might be incarcerated with other people. If we are in Caesarea, he's in a prison, not under house arrest as he would be in Rome. He would be incarcerated in Caesarea with evildoers of all kinds. He might be in the drunk tank. He might be there with robbers. He might be there with murderers. But the whole palace guard realizes this man is different. This man is not here because he is an evildoer. This man is here because he believes that there is another king. Because that's what the word Christ means, remember. It's the anointed one. He believes in another king, and that is why Caesar has bound him. And if not all have been converted, at least some almost certainly have, because now there are saints in Caesar's household who send their greetings along with Paul by Epaphroditus' hand. Now here's the point. There are people in proximity to that prison, in proximity to that palace, on in the employ of the Roman government on Caesar's staff, as it were, that would almost certainly have never heard the gospel otherwise. They are not going to go out to some open-air preaching campaign. There is no synagogue in Philippi, at least there was not when the church was planted there, that they could attend. They would have continued worshiping their idols, offering sacrifices to their false gods, worshiping demons until they died and went to hell, unless God had put Paul into the prison in their care. Now, they think that Paul is the captive, but actually they are the captive. They are a captive audience. Because wherever Paul goes, he's talking about Jesus. Wherever Paul finds himself, he's looking for opportunities to speak to people about the saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And these guards have to be there. This palace guard, I mean, it's their job to be there with Paul. He has a captive audience. Paul is chained, but as he says to Timothy in a later letter, the Word of God is not chained. These are people that would not have been reached unless Paul had been arrested and unless Paul's life had been threatened in Jerusalem and he had been transferred to Caesarea and then appealed to Caesar and is transferred to Rome, wherever he is as he's writing this letter, there are so many things that could have been different that the guards in Jerusalem could have let him go. Or in Caesarea, the, the governor could have vacated his case. They knew he was innocent. And yet, time and time again, providence seemed to turn against Paul to keep him incarcerated. How long is this going to last? Lord, what are you doing? A day turns into a week, turns into a month, turns into a year, turns into four years. When is this going to be over? But here's what you have to know. Those saints in Caesar's household, in chapter 4, verse 22, God knows their names. God knew their names before He said, let there be light. God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before Him. So there are men in the employ of the Roman Empire, serving on Caesar's staff, perhaps carrying weapons as members of the Roman guard, worshiping demons that were made by God for the purpose of holiness. And God always gets His man. Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 37, all that the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. And if, and if He has to throw Paul into prison to get him, so be it. If he has to throw Jonah into the sea and put him in the belly of a fish and have the fish go all the way down to the gates of Sheol, so be it. God always gets his man. And Paul says, you, you don't understand. You're thinking about me, but I want, you to I want you to think about what Jesus is doing. That he has not put me on the sidelines. He's just sent me to a different place so that I can reach people for Christ there. And again, Philippi, of all the churches Paul planted, Philippi understood this. Because the church in Philippi saw its earliest converts, Lydia and her household, then the Philippian jailer and his. You Paul, throw Paul in jail and he converts the jailer. But there's a second way in which his circumstances had advanced the gospel. That's in verse 14. Not only have more people been introduced to Christ, have seen now that Paul is a righteous victim of religious persecution, and some of them have been converted, but not only that, verse 14, most of the brethren in the Lord... Now we're talking about believers. Most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. There is a church in Caesarea. There are churches in Rome. Wherever we are, the brethren in Paul's immediate surroundings, and perhaps even in other places, who, like the Philippians, are concerned about Paul and asking about his circumstances, they are now emboldened by his situation, to stand up and to speak out on behalf of Christ. Now, this is counterintuitive. In the same way that taking the most effective evangelist off the field doesn't seem to advance the gospel and yet does, in the same way, persecuting a preacher would seem to discourage people in gospel witness. Oh, Pastor Joel got locked up last week. Let's not do the things that he was doing. Paul has been arrested, nearly beaten to death in Jerusalem. Let's just kind of keep our mouths shut. Let's be content to, to live good lives, but fly under the radar. But Paul says, no, the opposite has happened. The brethren have been emboldened. They're, they're growing in confidence because they see Paul suffering. And you can think about this in a couple of different ways. On the one hand, they might see in Paul's suffering the need, the vacancy. Paul isn't here to preach. Who's going to preach? I will. Who's going to teach? I will. Paul can't carry the gospel to places, but I, but I can. I, I can. I can do more. I've been content to sit back and just let Paul do it. It's, it's easy when you have somebody like Paul to just sit back and say, we'll let Paul preach today. We'll let Paul go do the work over there. We'll, we'll pray for you, Paul. Depart in peace, be warmed and filled. But when Paul's not there, the work's still got to be done. And some of the brethren have been emboldened to do that. Not only that, but perhaps in seeing Paul's suffering, they see how serious the kingdom is. Tertullian, in the early church, said that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. 
And what he meant by that was that the more viciously the church was persecuted, that their blood scattered like seed that just produced an incredible harvest because people saw this really matters. When there's no pressure on you, on your life, on your faith, it's easy to just kind of set the cruise control and check out as you roll on down the road. Your, your, your mind is wandering. You're not really focused at all on what's going on. But here, you are in the midst of a crisis and you, you are confronted with what is really important in this life. Your life is significant. And you are a priest king, a servant of the Holy God, ordained by baptism to a life of warrior prayer and work. And the brethren are stepping up. They become more bold to speak the word without fear. You cannot make us afraid. We see what you've tried to do with Paul, and we see how God is supporting and caring for him. He will care for us also. We might think that nothing good can come from difficult circumstances, but that is simply not true. God works in all circumstances, including, and maybe we should say especially, in those that are difficult. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, Paul says, we know, it's a very strong verb in Greek, we know that God works all things together for the good of those who love him, for those who are the called according to his purpose. You can't know who you will influence in the midst of suffering. You don't even know everyone who is watching. You might never know, at least not this side of glory, how many have benefited from circumstances that seem to you only bad, only negative. Nothing good came out of it. How can you know that? You don't sit in God's seat. See, the problem here is that we imagine all of the circumstances of our lives are about us. So whatever's going on in my life right now, that's about me. And God, it's really inconvenient, and it's discouraging, and it's, it's hindering my effectiveness. And maybe the Lord would smack me on the back of the head and say, you fool, it's not about you. What are my children learning from that adversity? What will my grandchildren be taught one day? What do my brethren around me, what do other people in the community see that I may never understand? God works all things together for the good of those who love him. And he loves you, but he loves more than you. And your example and experience in suffering may be an encouragement and inspiration to others, even of which you are unaware. We tend to estimate good only in terms of personal advantage. But what if you are suffering for the sake of someone else? What if you are suffering in a way that will eventually lead to your death for the sake of the influence it will have on your grandchildren who hear the story from the mouths of your children? What if your suffering today is for the benefit and blessing of someone who will not be born for two more decades? And do you think that that's impossible? Well, then think back to stories like that that have been told you by people that you have never met. What if I am not the Apostle Paul, but rather am the Christian whose example inspired Timothy to join him? You don't know the name of that Christian. I don't either. But we'll get to meet him one day. Because every person whose name you do know in the Bible was surrounded by other saints whose names you don't know, but whose lives were used by God to play a profound role in their part of the story. Do I only want a role in God's plan if it is prominent? If I'm the hero? If I'm the one who gets to accomplish the great thing and everybody looks at me and applauds? Or do I want to be used however God chooses to use me? Do I want to be the unseen father, grandfather, brother who lives in the background but whose story is used by God for someone who will do more than I could? We'll go on to verses 15 to 17 and notice the admission that Paul makes concerning some of the haughty preachers that have arisen at this time. He says, verse 15, some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife. And some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains. But the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. Now some of you will notice that verses 16 and 17 are reversed in your Bible. That's because of a textual variant. The substance of the two verses is exactly the same. But if you're reading out of the ESV or the New American Standard or something like that, then 
verses 16 and 17 will be in the other order than what I just read, but the, the text is unchanged nevertheless. Paul admits that not everyone who was preaching the gospel was doing so from pure motives. Now, I want you to notice he says they were preaching Christ, and that's going to be very important here in just a second. They were preaching Christ, but they were preaching from envy and strife. They were preaching, he says, from selfish ambition, and he says, even insincerely. And in a strange comment that that people wrestle to understand, he says, supposing, verse 16, supposing to add affliction to my chains. How in the world could preaching Christ add to Paul's suffering? Now, Paul admits that some were preaching Christ from a spirit of love, out of love for God, out of love for Paul while he's in prison. They're stepping up. They're trying to fill in. They're trying to carry the ball forward. They couldn't change Paul's circumstances, but they could carry on the work that he had been doing. They were motivated by a genuine desire to see the work that God had begun continuing to grow. But Paul admits that the preaching at that time, and maybe even that the Philippians had heard about, was certainly a mixed bag. Now let's think for a minute about how a carnally minded preacher might suppose that by preaching he could add affliction to Paul. He could make the chain that Paul is wearing heavier. He could add to his grief is the idea. Carnally minded people assume that everyone else thinks the way that they do. This is is a pretty, pretty universal principle, right? You can apply this to a lot. Carnally minded people assume that everyone else thinks the way that they do. And and this this could be kind of a diagnostic tool for yourself. If you assume that other people see the world exactly the same way you do, you might be a little more carnally minded than you realize. If you imagine that the only way to think about something is just the way that I think about it, it's so obvious that you, the only way that you could not look at it that way is if you're dishonest. What, you might not be thinking about it in the way that the Spirit of God would help you to think about it. Carnally minded people think everyone sees the world in the way that they do, and they see ministry as a means of self-promotion. A carnal word, worldview is a worldview largely built upon projection. And so they assume that Paul sees things the same way. We're going to step forward, we're going to preach, we're going to build the kingdom, and obviously Paul is doing it for the same reason that they themselves are doing it, which is out of selfish ambition. In their mind, they are robbing Paul of his glory. They're taking his place, they're making him irrelevant. See, Paul, we didn't didn't need you after all. You're not nearly as important as you imagined. You're not indispensable. You're easily replaceable. And now people are listening to us. People are coming to hear us. Churches are being planted by us. We are the man on the platform that everyone gets to listen to. We know that there are pastors who are pastors because they think like that. Motive matters. Motive matters. And motivation flows out of how we see the world and what our goals are. If a carnally minded person projects his own moral disorder upon everyone else in the world around him, and if he acts out of selfish ambition for self-aggrandizement, it will inevitably shape the kind of ministry that he does. Faithfulness is not merely doing the right things. It's doing them from the right motive. This is important in raising children. You, You are not trying merely to achieve conformity to rules. So you tell tell your son, stop playing with the toys, go down the hall and clean up your room, and he slams the toy down, gets on his feet, he stomps down the hall and slams the door to his room. He is obedient, sort of, but you're not done. Because you're not looking for mere conformity in terms of behavior. You're looking for the submission of heart. You're wanting him to be conformed to Christ, not just to the house rules. The Reformed tradition has said, traditionally, that there are three parts of a good work found in Scripture. A good work is a work performed on the right authority, in the right manner, and from the right motive. Heidelberg Catechism 91 summarizes it very well. What are good works? Only those that are done out of true faith, conform to God's law, and are done for His glory. Now, an unbeliever, he can do something that's consistent with God's law, but he can't do it out of faith because he's an unbeliever. And he doesn't do it for God's glory. 
He does it for his own. But sometimes even believers who obey God's law out of faith do the right thing in the right way for the wrong reason. And that's what's happening here. That's what Paul's talking about. They're preaching Christ, but not sincerely. They're preaching Christ to make Paul's grief greater, not to glorify God. But notice Paul's attitude, verse 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. Now, some of your Bibles will connect that last clause with the verse that follows, and there is a close connection that we'll see, Lord willing. But what then? I rejoice that Christ is preached. He affirms that the holy proclamation of King Jesus is a reason for thanksgiving, even when it is carried on out of selfish preaching by insincere men. Now, this immediately tells you something about the men that Paul is talking about And contrary to the conclusions of a number of brilliant scholars, these are not false teachers. At least not in the sense that the doctrine that they're teaching is false. They are preaching the truth. They are proclaiming Christ. How do you know that? Well, you know it because one of the consistent features of Paul's preaching is a denunciation of false teachers. I mean, it appears in almost every letter, including one as positive as Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 at the very beginning includes a rather strong denunciation of Judaizing teachers in which he refers to them as dogs. And that's fairly tame by Pauline standards. Paul can be far more aggressive than that when he talks about people who are corrupting the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says at the end of his letter to the Romans, mark such men and avoid them. He says to Timothy, identify them and withdraw from them. Paul does not rejoice in the preaching of error that would corrupt men's souls. Far from it, he condemns it. In his letter to the Galatians, in Galatians chapter 1, he says, if we or even an angel from heaven come and preach another gospel to you, such a one is accursed, eternally condemned. That's not who Paul's talking about. Now, Paul's talking about the kind of pastors some of us may know. And we don't know men's hearts But sometimes we can see from the fruit of their lives that their hearts surely have a lot of selfish ambition. And yet if they are preaching Christ like Paul, we should rejoice. Even if the character of these men was corrupt, the content of their preaching was faithful. Remember that Judas preached the gospel even while he was stealing from the money box. In other words, a hypocrite can preach truth. Now, this is a a tricky point. Because in one sense, if you are a hypocrite, you shouldn't expect that anyone would listen to you. Don't tell your children, do as I say, not as I do. No. Do what you say for your children to do. Live with integrity. Lead with integrity. But at the same time, when we're on the receiving end, we cannot turn down the volume or ignore the instruction that is true and consistent with the Word of God simply because we dismiss the messenger. Well, I I don't like that person. I don't think he's sincere. I think he's selfish. I think he's arrogant. The, The question is, is he speaking what's true or is he not? If it's true, then receive it. Receive it. Rejoice in it. And let God deal with the messenger. He will. Here are men who, if Paul's testimony is to be believed, which it is, these would be men who would be condemned on the day of judgment. Why? Because they're insincere. They're insincere, unless they repent. You can't be saved if you're insincere. Insincerity is kind of a big deal. These are men who are preaching the truth that saves men's souls, and their souls may be lost. But you don't have to worry about knowing the heart of the man who preaches the gospel to you. I mean, hopefully you would have good confidence in that. Hopefully it would be abundantly on display. His honesty, his integrity, his humility, whatever. But you don't have to worry, oh, what if, what if the pastor who baptized me proves to be a reprobate? What if the man who discipled me proves to be a hypocrite? And now I have nothing to stand upon. You have the exact same thing to stand on that you had all along, which is the truth of God. 
It's the Lord Jesus Christ. It is His authority that you believe, not the authority of man. You don't accept the authority of men, you accept the authority of God. And if he's preaching the truth, praise be to God. Paul rejoiced in knowing that Christ was being preached, even if the preachers themselves were not good men. Because his ambition was for Christ to be known and the kingdom to grow regardless of the instrument. That's what Paul wants. Christ to be known and the kingdom to grow, that's what he wants to see. He's not such a purist that he would rather there be no preaching than poor preachers. Ideally, we want good men of integrity preaching the truth that saves men's souls. But if Christ is being preached, we'll be happy with that. And so how do we evaluate men and ministries that we may question in terms of motive or character. And again, I'm not speaking about men who are sexually immoral. I'm not speaking about men who teach false doctrine. I'm talking about men who teach truth, but whose character is lacking in some way. And I suspect you know of people like that. I know men that, to be frank, I think are jerks for Jesus. But insofar as they proclaim Christ faithfully, we should rejoice. We should rejoice. Is that the best way to represent Christ? Probably not. No, certainly not. But if they proclaim Christ, then let us rejoice. By way of application and reflection, I want to I encourage you to think a little bit about the theme that I think joins all of these verses together, which is the ability to rejoice in hard providence that comes not only through external circumstances, but even through hurtful people at times. The Lord is at work in everything, in everything, and there are no coincidences. He works all things together for your good. That means the worst moments of your life. That means the worst experiences of your life. That means the worst sins that you've committed or that have been committed against you were ordained by God from the beginning and put together in the plan for your good. He doesn't promise that everything will be good or will become good, but He promises to work it all together for good. The Lord is sovereign over our circumstances, even the circumstances of our suffering, and He uses it for our good and His glory. And the Bible tells us what that good is that He's working all things together toward. For those whom He foreknew, Paul says in Romans 8, 29, the very next verse, those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. He works things together to make you more like Jesus. But this promise is only for those who love Him, for those who are the called according to His purpose. This is not a promise for the unbeliever. It's not a promise of indiscriminate optimism for everyone in every situation of life. You, you, can't, you can't take this to your unbelieving friend and say, don't worry, I know you're going through a hard time, but God promises to work it all for good. Not for him, them, He doesn't. But for you. And for them, if they will love Him and respond to His love in humble faith. The judgment of the unbeliever begins in this life, but so too do the eternal rewards of the saint. I want you to think about this for just a minute. I'm only going to take a minute. Paul is already experiencing the blessings of glory. You can see that because he's rejoicing in Christ even in prison. The reprobate who is damned is already experiencing the pains of hell. You can tell that because in his prosperity and endless celebration, he's still miserable. Lewis put it this way in his preface to the great divorce, quote, I think earth, if chosen instead of heaven, will turn out to have been all along only a region in hell. And earth, if put second to heaven, to have been from the beginning a part of heaven itself. In other words, what Lewis is saying is that what makes heaven heaven is not geography, it's communion. And what makes hell hell is not geography, it's reprobation, it's punishment. And so if you are in union and communion with the Lord Jesus right now, you're going to look back one day, you can't see it right now, but you're going to look back one day and you're going to say, God's always had his hand on me. In other words, you're, you're not going to pass into glory and say, wow, I'm glad that's over. That was really hard, 
Here, let's huddle up and spend 10,000 years sharing our gripes and our complaints about how difficult our lives were. We're going to come into glory and we're going to say, wow, God is awesome. And he has been so good. And in the same way, the reprobate will see that he's always been in torment. God does not promise to work everything together for my personal advantage, my material gain, my physical strength, or my financial prosperity. He promises to use everything in our lives to make us like His Son and to draw us closer to Him. And so how should we receive hard providence? We should do so with humility, with gratitude, and with joy. And this is going to be the consistent theme throughout the letter. Chapter 4 and verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. He says in verse 11, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I've learned, both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can rejoice in hard providence. You can rejoice in pain. You can rejoice when when you're so miserable that you really wish you would die because you would be glad for the suffering to be over. You can rejoice in the Lord always. The Lord is our shepherd. And He will watch over and safely lead and protect all of His sheep. Jesus says in John chapter 10 and verse 10, I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. It's not just, I I want you to have heaven one day, someday, when your suffering here is over. I want you to have a more abundant life right now. No, not because you're healthier, you're getting weaker. Not because you're richer, you might be getting poorer. Not because your life's getting easier, it might be getting harder. But you enjoy communion with Jesus. That changes everything. We may be surrounded by enemies and sorrows, but in Christ we are enabled to feast in the midst of our foes. So providence, prison, and preaching Christ are the key themes in verses 12 to 18, and I think suggest important lessons for all of us. So may the Lord give us grace to receive meekly, gratefully, and joyfully the hard providence that He uses to make us more like Jesus and to advance His glory and His will in this world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's bow together. Gracious God, we thank you so much for the example of your servant Paul. We desire, O Lord, to see that joy that is so evident in his writing uh, to be similarly evident in our own hearts and in our own lives. O God, we are often preoccupied with our own complaints and our own struggles And yet, uh, his ability to perceive your providence in the midst of hard circumstances is indeed a lesson to us all. So help us to learn how to rejoice in Jesus no matter our specific situation. Help us to know and have confidence that you work all things together for the good of those who love you. Help us to rejoice, O God, in the proclamation of Christ and in the accomplished work of the Lord Jesus and apply the benefits and blessings of that work to us continually even until we stand in the Lord's presence one day. We ask in Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen.